Hello, this is Alan Murphy. I'm the pastor of New Barn Christian Fellowship in Dartford in Kent, uh, United Kingdom. And we're going through a series on the women of the Bible. And we've looked at a few women. We've looked at Sarah, we've looked at uh, Rachel, and uh, we are now going to be looking at uh, Deborah today uh, from Judges chapter 4. If you've got a Bible and you want to turn to it, or an iPad or something, or your phone, I'm just going to read a few verses uh, from chapter 4. But the account of Deborah goes all the way through chapter 4 and chapter 5 up to Gideon. But I'll just read a few verses, uh, Judges chapter 4. It says, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go Take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. And in verse 8 it says, But Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you, but because of the way you are going about this, the honour will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. Ten thousand men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now I'm going to pause there. I could have carried on to finish the story, uh, but it's quite a long one and you can read it yourself. So we've got a situation where <clears throat> Deborah is uh, a judge of Israel and God raised up uh, judges to uh, rule over the people. At that particular point, they didn't have a king. And I want to look at, uh, first of all, uh, her name, uh, Deborah. I think it's important to look at people's names in the Bible. If you don't do that, then perhaps you can start doing that because there's a wealth of information and spiritual truth when you look at someone's name. Now Deborah or Devorah uh, as it would be in the Hebrew um, means a bee, okay, B-double-E, -E, a bee. And <clears throat> the root, I'm just going to show you <clears throat> the word here, okay, Deborah means a bee. Now the Hebrew root uh, if you've listened to some of my other uh, talks, you'll know that the Hebrew language doesn't have vowels like letters in the way that we have. So there's no E, there's no O, there's no A in Deborah. All right. Um, the root is D-B-R. OK, D-B-R. That's the root. And the word making up dbr there is a word i'm just going to write it in for you um <clears throat> is dabar d-a-b-a-r dabar so if we were to put the um vowels in we'd get the word dabar now the word dabar uh it means to pronounce to speak to arrange and to be orderly, <clears throat> okay? To pronounce, to speak, to arrange, and to be orderly. That's Deborah. Now, don't forget, we're looking at women of the Bible. And certainly, when I look at those uh, definitions, I see very much a pattern as to the qualities that there are very, very much uh, in a woman, particularly the arranging and uh, things being done 
in order. Now, what I tend to do is when I look at a word and it gives me the meaning of a B, I will then look at a B uh, and see if there's anything in a B that I can learn which is applicable to our passage, which we can then glean some spiritual truth. And you know, the main role, there's lots of roles that a queen bee has in a colony. Uh, she has a number of workers looking after her uh, and all sorts of things, but her main job is to reproduce. And that is really important in a spiritual context. Because God said to Adam and Eve, didn't he, right at the beginning of time, be fruitful and multiply. The Bible says a lot, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy, it mentions the word generations, generations, tell the generations, remind the generations. There's a very strong generational thrust and theme going right the way through the Bible. Because God, what? God breathes into being, he wants to continue. And if he uh, anoints a couple or a person to do a particular work or ministry, when that person uh, moves on, passes over, dies, lays it down, God raises someone else up so that it continues. So that's a spiritual truth that what God has put in your heart, uh, he wants to continue not only through you but through other people as we pass on as we bless as we deposit spiritual truth in the lives of other people now deborah herself uh, she was the uh, fourth judge uh, if you go back to chapter 3 and verse 7 it speaks about othniel OK, Othniel being the first judge and uh, Othniel in chapter three and verse seven, um, it says that God raised him up and he was he released uh, God's people after they had been uh, really suppressed by the animal, uh, by the enemy, not by the animal <laughs> for seven years. OK, and then Ehud in chapter 3 and verse 14 was used by God to release God's people after 18 years and yet Deborah was used by God to release God's people after 20 years so in a sense she had a she had a harder job than the two or the three previous judges uh, in fact, um, the third judge, Shamgar, we don't really know much about him at all. It says after Ehud in chapter 331 came Shamgar, son of Anat, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Uh, he too saved Israel. So not a lot to be recorded about him, but certainly lots recorded about Deborah. Um, and I think that is significant. Uh, in her life and what we are attempting to glean uh, from what she did and the fact that she was a woman of God who was raised up who was anointed who was who was set aside for a particular work as I was thinking about um, women and uh, great women if you like the God uh, God uses great women and the ones he'd used over the years I was thinking of Corrie Ten Boom and uh, Corrie was, um, I don't know if you know the story, but, but during the war, uh, she used to hide Jewish people in her home. And um, that's why she wrote the book, The Hiding Place. And there were so many that were thankful to her and her family for giving them refuge. And so under danger of her life, risk of her life, um, God used her to rescue these people in a similar way, really, to how God used Deborah to rescue people. And um, the hiding place was 
was not only a, um, a reference uh, to her home, but also a reference to Psalm 119 and verse 114, where it says, you are my hiding place. And uh, she actually is honoured um, at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, and there's a, a garden called the Garden or the Avenue of the Righteous Gentiles. And she has a tree there. They have acknowledged her work and her bravery and her heroism during the war towards Jewish people. So just another person out of many that God has raised up in his plan um, to bring about release and to bring about deliverance. And I just want to say to you today that that God can use you in exactly the same way. And you might look at yourself, as a lot of women do particularly, and they think that they're not as good as <coughs> men, possibly. Um, the emphasis is on men, certainly in leadership. And here we have, uh, she was, Deborah was, a leader. And whatever your theology is about church leadership, the fact is that God has used women mightily in church leadership. He has used women mightily in church planting and preaching and healing and all sorts of ministries. And we'll come uh, to that in, in, a, in a few moments when we, uh, we look at another point. But be encouraged that God can use you and wants to use you and perhaps he has used you and we can thank God for that in the same way that he was using Deborah. <coughs> now we're going to move on to um, our second word and um, <laughs> Deborah has uh, an accomplice. Now I say an accomplice, I suppose he was an accomplice in, in verse 8, Barak. He gets an opportunity. Uh, she says to him, go and raise a bit of an army and go and attack Sisera. I'll lure him into, into a place where you can attack him. So she was basically saying, you'll, you'll be attacking him and I'll be luring him. So we won't be in the same place. And he didn't like that idea. And his response was, well, in verse eight, Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. So he needed her around. He needed her confidence. He needed her leadership ability, if you like, to be able to accomplish um, what needed to be done. And interestingly enough, she says, OK, very well. In verse nine, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you were going on about this, you know, the fact that you don't want to do it on your own, the honour will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. All right. So um, and there are two women involved here. There's Deborah and there is a woman uh, called Jael or Yael. All right. So um, we're going to look for a few minutes at, at Yael and uh she appears a little bit later on um, in verse 18. Yael went out to meet Sisera and then he comes into her tent uh, and she kills him with a, with a tent peg, puts it through. Uh, it's not very nice, is it? Puts it through his temple up here um, and uh, mallets it down and he dies on the spot. But Yael, you see, again, you look at somebody's name. And I believe you get some, <clears throat> excuse me, you get some truth coming from a name, right? J-A-E-L, Yael. And it means to ascend, to ascend, to be valuable, to be profitable. All right. So you look at a person called Yael. And there's a sense of going up, of rising up. Certainly the sense and the truth of being valuable and certainly being profitable. 
So when you look at her involvement in the story, that she has the courage to approach him. Because in verse 18, it says, Yael went out to meet Sisera. Now, it might be that if she'd have stayed in her tent, he would have just walked past. But she went out to meet him. She took the initiative with this commander, this general. I mean, you know, a formidable person, a formidable man. <clears throat> she takes the initiative and she does the job, what's required. So she really plays a valuable and a profitable role. She is a key figure in the whole release and salvation and deliverance of the people of God from these enemies. And what this teaches us is that Yael wasn't a leader. You don't have to be a leader in order to uh, scare the enemy, in order to put a den in the enemy's armour. And I really uh, love the fact that whenever you have prayer meetings at church, um, you know, the women turn up. It's the women who are intercessors. It's the women who pray. And, you know, if you took women out of the equation, <clears throat> then really I don't know where we would be as a church. And um, you get this whole thing today, don't you? You still get this rivalry between men and women and women are better than men and men are better than women and equality and all that sort of thing. Well, let's just look at the scripture and let's see how valuable women are in God's economy, in God's kingdom. And we'll see as we go along and look at other women, how they bring a different element, if you like, to the table, to the kingdom, to the release and the deliverance and the blessing. And I, I love this element of <clears throat> rising up. Uh, recently, I was um, just watching on, on television uh, darts uh, and, and they had a they had a tournament on, on, on darts and there was a program about darts and there was this this lady and her name is Fallon Sherrick Fallon Sherrick and uh, she is the first woman in history of darts to beat a man so uh, she <laughs> she entered this competition which I think was the world professional darts championship and uh, normally all men, <clears throat> never a woman involved, but she entered it. And in the first round, she beat a man. And in the second round, she beat a man. Uh, and in the third round, I think she just narrowly got beat three sets to two. It was very, very narrow. And there were all placards up, you know, power to women and all this sort of thing. And And I don't go by all that but what I go by is the fact that a woman felt that she was a, able to break in to a man's world so all credit to her it's not about whether you're a woman or a man it's about the fact that she's good enough and she went in and she proved that she was good enough so praise God for that initiative praise God for that bravery praise God for that courage and what I see here is a tremendous courage by this woman, Yael, uh, to, to do what she did, took a lot, a lot of courage. <clears throat> and over the years, I mean, I've been a pastor for, for many years, really. And um, the, the people at my, my first church where I was in Dartford, um, they were brought up and taught, you know, that women shouldn't. Uh, speak in church women shouldn't do this they shouldn't do that they you know there were lots of restrictions on women and and I would say to them one particular lady I said well could would you preach and she said oh no I, I won't preach because that means I'm having authority over a man and and the bible says that you shouldn't have authority over a man uh, so I said okay then will you share from the word and she said, oh, yes, I'll share from the word, <clears throat> but I won't preach. 
And and that always tickled me a little bit, really. And I thought, well, OK, so what's the difference? You know, you're standing up and you're speaking from the Bible. When you preach, you're speaking from the Bible. It was just that word preach. <clears throat> and um, regarding the authority over men, I felt that even though she was speaking and she was speaking to a mixed group, including men and women, she was still under my authority because I was the minister. Right. So she was under authority. Uh, and I think that made her a little bit uh, happier. Um, but without going into it, and that's for another time, there are restrictions in the New Testament on women speaking. And Paul says very clearly, you know, about women uh, having to be silent in church. Now, for me, that is a cultural um, thing that Paul is addressing that was happening in those days. And it's it's hard sometimes to take the culture of the Bible and transition it to our culture. And we have to think very carefully about whether God actually wants that to happen for us and through us. Because if women were silent in our meetings, they wouldn't pray, um, they wouldn't share, they wouldn't testify. And, and we would be far poorer, a lot poorer uh, for a richness of fellowship um, if we were not able to listen to the way that women share. And I actually prefer listening to women preach. And I do many way, men. I, I think women have got more to say. I think they're more expressive. Um, I think they're more heartfelt, they're more passionate, uh, and that's just me. Uh, it may be that, that you disagree, but praise God for the women. That's that's where I'm coming from, really. I'm trying to encourage you, and hopefully I am, to see that, yes, there is a place for you. Yes, you can break through like this darts player did and come to a place that you probably haven't been to before. So I trust that you are in a fellowship, you're in a church somewhere which allows you to express what God is doing in your life. And that has got to be a good thing. And you, you can make a case for women preaching and speaking and doing all sorts of things in the Bible. So just pray that God will release you and that you won't just be responsive but like jail, you would take the initiative and go out there. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to just uh, finish on our um, third point. Chapter five and verse seven. And I love this. I've always loved this about Deborah. Uh, chapter five, verse seven. And it says <clears throat> village life in Israel ceased. It ceased until I, Deborah, arose arose a mother in Israel and I love that phrase a mother in Israel and uh, there have been women over the years and, and I've ministered with them and, uh, and I've been their pastor and all that sort of thing there's been a, a few not many but there's been a few women that I've spoken to and I said I believe you are a mother in Israel and there are characteristics about who you are now they they have all been mothers in the natural sense, but there was a spiritual mothering about them towards other Christians. And uh, and this was the case with Deborah. And um, it says about being a mother and I've put the word up here. Now it's it's Eam. OK, E-Y-M, Eim, in Hebrew, that's the word for mother. Now, these are the two Hebrew letters. We go from right to left. So that's the that's the Aleph. OK, that's the the E, -E bit. And that's the Mem, that's the M. So it's Eim. Now, if we look at the Aleph figure, all right, the Aleph. In Hebrew, uh, don't forget that Hebrew started off as a pictorial 
language. So you had pictures and that represented a word. And the Aleph, which means it's the Aleph Bet, so it's the first letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet, the Hebrew alphabet, and it has an ox head. All right, ox head, because it's the first. It's the head. Okay, so that's the ox head, the Aleph. And it also means strong. And it means authority. So within the name mother, or the term mother, you have someone who has authority. <clears throat> you have someone who is strong and someone who leads. Now, she may not be the ultimate leader. The father might be the ultimate leader. But in this day and age of split and dysfunctional families, very often you'll get the woman who needs to lead. And she does lead. And they lead very, very well. So that's that first letter, leading, authority, strong, oxed, and this mem, okay, uh, water <coughs> in Hebrew is mayim, and that is the, the sign for water, it means water. So you've got someone who is strong in authority, and you could say who provides water who provides sustenance. And uh, that is really, really important. Um, it means to bind together, okay? Bond of the family, there is a binding. The mother binds people together in the family. And certainly, uh, the Hebrews, when they would take the skin of animals and they would um, boil the water and they would put the skin of the animals in the boiling water, you would get a sort of a glue substance, a sticky substance which binds things together. And that's what a mother does. And that's what is happening with Deborah. She's binding things together. And that comes out in, in chapter five, um, in a number of verses, uh, actually. In verse nine, she says, my heart is with Israel's princes. There's a with, there's a togetherness. Uh, about it in verse 10 uh, you who ride on white donkeys sitting on your saddle blankets you who walk along the road consider the voices of the singers at the watering places uh, verse 10 and 11 the watering place was a place where people came and they had fellowship and they exchanged ideas and stories and life experiences it was a coming together it was a binding that's what happens when we fellowship at church we bind we come together <clears throat> and in verse uh, 13 uh, it says then the men who were left came down in verse 14 some came from Ephraim. There seems to be a gathering together again of people. They are coming back because earlier on it says in verse 7, village life in Israel ceased. It stopped. So many things stopped because they were under persecution. They were under oppression. Now that threat has been taken away, things are released. And people are coming back. So these people in, in verse 13, the men who were left came down to the nobles. Verse 14, from Machir, uh, captains came down. So there's a coming together. And that's what a mother does. She gets 
people together. She is a home maker. And in verse uh, 21, um, as part of her song, because this is all <coughs> part of her song in chapter 5, the song of Deborah. In verse 21, she says, march on my soul, be strong. <coughs> and that's a rallying call. That's a come on, let's get together. And, you know, at our peril, we undermine the ministry of women in the body of Christ. And if you're a woman and you're listening to this, then make sure that you feel that what you're offering to your church, what you are in the way that you're ministering, that it's not taken for granted, it's not undervalued, but that people do value and people should value you. And your pastor should value you for what you have to offer. I know it's been said that if you're uh, a woman who is at home and you do the washing and you do the cooking and you do the cleaning and you take the kids to school, if you pull that together, um, you are a manager because you manage the children. You are a chauffeur because you're chauffeuring people around. You are a carer. You are a nurse. You are a tailor and a repairer because you, you probably mend uh, clothes <laughs> to all sorts of things. Um, you're financially astute. You're a teacher. You're so many things. And if you were to put a monetary value on that, you could be looking at in excess of £100,000 a year. Because if you were to employ all different people in the jobs that a mother did, even just to the hour, not all day, obviously, you wouldn't need a show for all day, but you would find that the value was would, would be enormous and you won't be able to afford it. But you don't have to afford it because you have your, your lady, your wife or whatever. Now, that doesn't mean, <laughs> doesn't mean, uh, don't beat me up yet, it doesn't mean that women are tied to the kitchen sink. Not at all. And there are men. In fact, you know, one of my own sons, he's a house husband and he does all those chores. And, and that's fine. <clears throat> what I'm trying to get at is if you are a lady and you stay at home, that is your job. And it's a really difficult job. The man can go out to the office and he leaves the family, leaves all that behind and he goes off out of the house he hasn't got to worry about dentist appointments for the kids he hasn't got to worry about injections he hasn't got to worry about taking him to the doctors and the hospital if they're ill and all he ain't got to worry about any of that because he's out if you're a woman and you are at home then thank god for that very very valuable ministry that primarily is given to him primarily you do it for him and if you get that in your own heart you think yes lord primarily i'm doing it for you i think that will really help you really really help you to think wow this is part of my worship so there we go just as we draw to a close we've been 33 minutes now deborah was uh, a bit of a magnet really and i was just talking to a lady yesterday and she said, oh, she said, all these people, I keep coming across lots of new people. God's bringing all these people across my path. And I said, well, that's because you're a magnet. And I think someone else told her that she was a magnet. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? Jesus was a magnet. You know, people from the countryside came to hear him. The Pharisees and Sadducees, who didn't like him at all, came to hear him because they were curious. And they wanted to trip him up. Wherever Jesus went, he drew crowds. He was a magnet, the most amazing magnet that there's ever been. And so just as we close, really, I want to I want to commend uh, Deborah to you today, uh, a leader, um, a mother in Israel uh, who worked with jail to achieve the victory and to release and to set the people free. And I believe we can take the spirit of Deborah and we can make sure that our legacy, whoever we are, 
and we're talking about women, women particularly, that a legacy goes on and on. We deposit our legacy in the lives of our children. Who is it who reads bedtime stories usually to the children? Is it women? I think it's probably more women than men. Who is it who might read a Bible story to their children? I think it's more women than men. So you get the women who who are the the biggest impression on the children. And that is an awesome task, an awesome responsibility, but an awesome privilege. So thank God, praise God for the Debras of this world. And if you're not a Deborah, you can become one. And if you are a Deborah, hallelujah, keep Debraing. God bless you. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.